everybody to another episode of Clare GATV speaking to Clare Sporting uh, icons and legends who offer have done so much for their club and counties and colleges and whatever they've been with all their lives. And with us today now, we've travelled all the way down to Australia. He's still wearing, I'm not sure, I think it's a Milltown top. Maybe it's a maybe it's a Kimori Bricken top. I'm a bit colourblind at times, but maybe Carl Walsh could probably inform us more. I, I think that's I think that's St. Joseph Milltown Crest, is it, Carl? It is, it is. Uh, I've great respect for Kimoya Bricken, and they've done amazing things in the last two decades in particular, but it is a Milltown top. Okay, that's fine. Uh, we were chatting briefly last week, and you were just coming off a pitch after refereeing. Was it a ladies' football game or a Camogie game that you were refereeing last, last Saturday, or what was it? Oh, they wouldn't let me near the Camogie, uh, being from West Clare, but uh, it was a ladies' football league game, and it was very exciting, actually. It was 5-12 to 5-10. It went down to the wire, and... Um, it was very actually. It was very exciting refereeing it as well. So I suppose while she had a strong lockdown last year, you seem to be more relaxed now, and life is back to normal to a certain degree in Australia. Yeah, no, you could say that. I mean, it's 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 amazing, uh, really, how much it is back to normal. In fact, I had a walk this afternoon with a friend from Tipperary, Joe Grogan, and uh, we were just commenting on that as we as we walked down by St Kilda and saw so many people out doing so many activities and because we're both Irish and we've been here a long time and we know a lot of people back in Ireland we were reflecting on how difficult it is in Ireland based on what we're hearing and reading whereas here in Melbourne it is practically back to normal and I suppose we might just chat about this before we talk about your own thing how actively involved are you now in um, I suppose social activities in Australia outside of work uh, my wife would say uh, way too much involved, which sounds like a replay of our household years ago where my mother described herself as a GA widow, which may be why wife is fast becoming. So, I mean, I'm coaching kids, uh, you know, underage here in, in Gaelic football. I'm the president of the, of the junior club. I'm also a delegate on, if you like, our county board, which is Gaelic Games Victoria, which is relatively newly formed. And more recently now, I'm going to be on the board of um, Aus uh, Australasia, uh, being our representative on that board. So I'm very heavily involved, uh, Michael, but enjoying every minute of it. And my son's involved as well, which which makes it you know great as well. He he uh, he's playing a bit of football as well as Aussie rules, so that makes it nice that he's involved. And my wife does take an interest if he's playing; she comes along to watch. And in fairness, I think she's happy it gets me out of the house. Fair enough. I suppose. We talk, you're talking about your own family. <clears throat> Give us just a, a brief outline, I suppose, of your, I suppose your life and times up to when you were probably, we just say, a, a minor and the people that you knew back in Milltown that helped you all the way. Yeah, sure. I mean, well, you know, Milltown, Milltown, Malbay and its surrounds was a very rich and entertaining and wonderful place to grow up. I mean, I spent a bit of my life obviously in Limerick because dad was stationed there in the army but uh, you know Milton was um, I was a joy I mean you know as you get older you're probably reflecting this more in terms of a place by the sea so we spent a lot of our summers at the White Strand and Spanish Point with my two best friends who are still my two best friends Seamus Laffin who now lives in the Midlands and David Hillary who has a pub in the main street and I knew their families well their mother and father and spent a lot of time actually with Jerry Hillary who was a publican David's father in the main street and was a an amazing character. Uh, I do remember, you know, being at school in Milltown for a period of time when my, my mother was uh, just had Lisa, who's my middle sister, and Michal O'Friel was teaching us, who was a legend, you know, in the school, and uh, he was trying to drum Irish into us in a nice way, I must say, in a very civilised way. But I have great memories from that time. And in fact, David's brother, Gerald, was in, we were in class together, who was, who was a lovely chap. He was also a lifeguard out in Spanish Point. And, you know, we knew all the lifeguards. Like, Joe Canelli was a great character. And, you know, we did the life-saving classes, and there was lots of crack and entertainment around that. In terms of football, I mean, the first person, uh, my father obviously was a massive influence. But when I was younger, he just brought me out to the football field. And, you know, I was no different. I just went out and did my thing, like all the other kids at the time. Now it's wonderful because it's boys and girls. That time it was... It was mostly boys, but no, of course, it's, it's, it's as it should be, very equal. Uh, but Pete Cleary was the first influence. Pete was, I, he was a relation of Pather and Sean Cleary, who I played football with and won a champion. I was lucky enough to win a championship with in 1990. Two fine footballers. 
And Pete would have come back, I think, from America because he had a very strong American accent. I always remember he wore a baseball cap and spoke with certain Americanisms, but he sort of introduced us to the game. And then, of course, as we got a little bit older and it got a slightly more sophisticated, Cyril Jones took over and he managed all our teams. He was a great Milltown goalkeeper and Clare goalkeeper, an absolute gentleman, uh, you know, great businessman in the town, came from an amazing family with a lot of history, of course, tied up with, you know, the black and tans and all that, because the jersey I'm wearing actually is a commemorative one, commemorating 1920 and the three martyrs who lost their lives. Uh, and, and I played with Cyril's son, John Jones, who probably was the most talented and outstanding footballer uh, for us underage growing up. And then, you know, then when we got to, you know, sort of, we were knocking on the door of the senior team. I mean, the most influential people were, well, Donnie Buckley, who was our, our coach and manager in, um, or sorry, coach in 1990. But John Reedy also was a huge influence on us in so many, he put the fear of God into us, I must say, which was fine. I mean, I, some of us responded pretty well to that. And I was okay with that um, that methodology. But John was an amazing guy. He did so much for the team, so much for the club, and so much for the town. Um, J- John is an icon of Milton GA, a wonderful person. Yeah, I suppose maybe then you, you, you refer back to a lot to 1990. I suppose it was, would we say it was maybe the zenith of your career with St. Joseph Milton? I suppose for a lot of those lads that you won a county championship, maybe you can give us a little bit of a run into how that how that came about and the people the, I suppose the lads that were in charge of the team and I suppose yeah I so I mean it, 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 Zenith is a good word I mean not, not that it's all about you know winning because uh, again I think as you get older it's actually and I think I saw a pretty famous footballer quoted recently is about the people you played with and against and the friends you make and that sounds like a cliche but it's not and you appreciate that more and more particularly when you go home from Australia and the people you, you bump into but of course it was a Zenith because and I always remember what my father said to me after we won the county final and we had a big celebration the week after in Milltown, went to every pub and, 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 and the surrounds. And it, it, I think, you know, it meant so much to people. Like it meant so much to so many people in the parish. That's kind of what struck me was how much it meant to people young and old, particularly, say, more mature people, you know, who mightn't have seen Milltown, win, although we won it in 85. But, you know, my father said to me, treasure it because you might never win another one. But of course, when you win one, you're relatively young, you think. It's going to be like this every year. And we got to the county final the following year, but beaten by Dunbeg. But the fact of the matter is that he was right. We only won, I only won one. And I was lucky to win one. A lot of players don't win one. But the lead up to it was interesting because uh, we started off in the first round to beat Kilrush and a very windy day in Kilmel. And I, that was my really my first time playing senior championship because Johnny Buckley took the risk and I played with UCC and he put me into the goals that day, which was a big risk. Um, but it worked and we, we, we beat them relatively easily in the end you know uh, uh, I think we, we scored a few goals that day with, with the breeze but then we had a very tense encounter I think with um, in the semi-final with Cora Clare in fact there was a little bit of controversy with myself where a ball I didn't handle that well you know it was the county, the Cora Clare players were on and shouting and saying across the line and for a second I thought the umpire was going to pull up the green flag it's, you're giving me the heebie-jeebies actually reminded me of it but fortunately he didn't how things could you know how things could have been different yeah. if he had Rightly or wrongly, we'd have been knocked out and never won a championship, and I'd have been rightly blamed, you know, for, for making them for making the mistake. But but um, but then we went on to the final. We played Kilmel, a very good Kilmel team at the, the time. One of the best players in the field was a guy called Brendan Brown, playing centre back, who I played with the county level, a fantastic fella and a lovely guy. And they had a very good side, and and um, it was a, you know it was a reasonably dour encounter if you look at the video now. Football was a bit different that time, but um, Sean Burke was the X factor that day because he. He was the opportunist who got the goal. But I must say that the players that stood out for me that day and in that campaign were Martin Flynn at one end, who won the man of the match that day, deservedly. And very close to him was Jerry Curtin at fullback, uh, you know, who, who was just incredible in front of me uh, that day. And, 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 you know, in terms of the, John was the manager, John Reed was the manager, Donny was the coach, you know, um, lots of great people were, were, were involved um, at that time with us. Michael Mahoney, the famous musician played football with my father was involved, which was great, which meant that after the matches, we were going to have a lot of crack. In fact, that wasn't really a problem in Milton at the time. We had a lot of fellas who loved, and Joe Cullen, of course, who actually ha- made a cameo appearance that day. Uh, I think he was a corner forward, pulled out a bottle of brandy in the dressing room before the match and asked me, did I want to drink? Uh, which, which I declined. Um, but he had one and, and I think a few others part, partook as well of it. But, 
we had a lot of great. We did quite a mature team that time. We had some young players, but we had a lot of we had a lot of um, mm. mature players who were physically very strong, and we had a very very strong defence. And then we had a guy called, well, I shouldn't say Pat Murray at midfield, who was a colossus, you know, play county as well. So we were very fortunate the players we had and the support we had, both you know on the sideline and in fact through the whole town. Yeah, I suppose. I suppose then you you got on the Clare senior football panel. You were on it for uh, a number of years. I suppose. I mean, the highlight obviously would have been in the involvement in nineteen ninety two. But I suppose out of that, outside of the nineteen ninety two um, role, what was your key memories of being involved with Clare teams? Yeah, when yeah. I was a sub in ninety two, and 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 rightly so, because James Henry was was the goalkeeper. James Henry was a better goalkeeper than me, and always was a better. And I would always say that. Um, but you know, I tried to compete with him as best I could, and you know, I'd be very, you know, I'd be very honest with this. I was fortunate to break into the team, and and he was unfortunate to be out of the team at times because he, James Henry, was a class player and probably should have been an all star in my view. He was one of the most talented footballers ever to play for Clare and certainly, in my view, the best goalkeeper ever to play for Clare, despite, I think, a recent um, vote on that. Um, but that's my, that's my view. I'm a big fan of his. Um, but, but, I, but I mean, it's more than just winning 92. And, and 92 was incredible. I mean, it was, you know, we went missing for a week, of course, and it was great fun after that. And, but that, there, was, there was amazing memories. I mean, the amount of work we put in. I mean, I know it's a very advanced nowadays. They've got nutritionists and psychologists. Well, actually, John... Mohan introduced a lot of that at the time and he was quite advanced ahead of his game. But the thing that stood for me was the amount of, of work we put in. I mean, when he took over where we were before in terms of work rate and work ethic and preparation, it was it was like night and day. And we all learned to, well, you, you didn't keep stay on the panel unless you embraced the work, whether it was Christian or in Lahinch. I mean, all of what happened was true. You know, there's, there was no legend there. It was just hard work, you know, week in, week out. And then the work that you would do on your own, like I was, I was working in Limerick at the time and I was a sub keeper, but I would go out and practice my kick on my own at lunchtime. You know, we were that dedicated, you know, you'd take off your suit, you know, go and kick the ball in and out, practice your kick outs until you got a chance. And, you know, whenever that chance would come, I had to wait over two years to get a chance, nearly three years, actually. Uh, but everybody was dedicated like that. All the subs at the time were very dedicated, meant to get on the team. And of course we had a very talented team. I mean, you had the, you had the core of a, uh, of a very very talented team, and John brought the best out of us. But we great, we had a great run. I mean, we, you know, we won the All Ireland B in '91. David Keane was a star that day in the final up in Banlaslow. Of course, we won '92. We gave Dublin an awful rattle in the semi final. We were the first ever Clare team to make Division One in '93 when we beat Monaghan. I was lucky enough to play that day, uh, and play, and we played in Division One. Although we did come straight down, but you so, know, to, I, I we suppose, Carl, mm. a lot of people forgot about the fact that you were in the top eight or ten league teams for two or three years and that is often hidden by the fact that because of the Munster Championship your, your consistency over half a decade in the top leagues was, was sort of sidelined a little bit Yeah, it was sidelined I mean, you know we, we, we narrowly lost to Tipperary in 94 in the semi-final we were a bit unfortunate there but, you know at the end of the day in the Championship unfortunate doesn't work you either win it or you lose it and that, that took a lot of momentum and of course John John stepped away after that, which was a huge loss to us, um, which was such a shame. You know, if we'd, if we'd got through in 94, who knows what would have happened? Because we certainly had a lot of belief and a lot of confidence and we were well able for Cork and Kerry at the time. You know, in Division 1, I think we learned a lot. Whilst, whilst we, I think we won one match and drew one match and lost the rest. The only match we lost badly was up against Derry and Belahi in late 93. I remember that day, every single ball I kicked out. That time there was no short kickouts. Was kicked yeah. long, and Anthony Tall kicked every, caught every single ball, whether it was left, right, or in the centre. I think the only player who played well that day was John Enright, who was outstanding on Damien Cassidy. Um, but 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 you know, against Dublin, we lost by two points in Ennis. You know, some of the games we lost very narrowly, and we learned a lot. So you're right, we were a very competitive team for a good period of time, and then John O'Keefe came in, and I think we were pretty competitive when he came in. I mean, I was on the panel for seven years. Then there was a gap. I went to Russia. And then I came back and Tommy Curtin brought me in three years. So I suppose all told it was about eight years on the panel. Uh, but and John O'Keefe brought something different. And of course, he, 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 got, he got them to a Munster final, uh, which, which was an achievement. But uh, no, clear, clear football has changed ever since because now we are a dual county, in my view, whilst the footballers are not up where the hurlers were for you know, a long period of time. We're, we're genuinely seen as a, as a competitive county and being in, you know, relatively speaking, 
near enough the top bracket. And that all came from that era and yes. John Mohan. And it, we, we, <coughs> when you, you won, you had a very successful tenure when you were a student in UCC. You can maybe tell mm. us something about that. Yeah, I, I'm, I, my father kept saying to me, you're the luckiest footballer alive. And I, 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 think I, I think he was right. He was right in most things. In fact, you say that at meetings that he was always right. So maybe he was right most of the time. But, you know, now that he's gone, we'll, we'll say that anyway. But, um, yeah, I mean, I was in UCC and I think we won the, my first year, we won the Freshers' Cup, which was, you know, for first years in Limerick, that tournament was very competitive, very talented footballers playing for all the various universities. But obviously the cream came on top in my third year. I was doing law in uni when we won the Sigerson. Lucky for me, the goalkeeper was a Roscommon Intercounty. He finished college or if, yeah, the year before uh, I got into the senior team. And I got in and Barry Coffey, it was Barry Coffey put me in goals because I was injured. And he said, we want you to play in goals. You have a good kick out and you have a fair, you know, reasonable pair of hands. And, you know, he said, you know, we think you can, you can do well there. So, of course, I remember ringing home saying, what am I going to do? And Dad said, listen, playing the goals, you're going to be on the team, give it a go, because the rest of them are, dubbed, are Cork and Kerry Intercounty players, you know, mine are 21. So I took his advice, and that's what I did. And um, the rest was history. We won. The Sigurdsson that time, you played three matches over the weekend. Yes. Uh, three in a row. So, for, which for the outfield players was was huge. I mean, I remember the, how sore they were the night of each match, and they'd be getting into the bat. That time, there was, you know, we'd no backup team. So fellas getting into bats and sticking ice on themselves and you know doing their best to limber up before the next day. And we beat um, Jordanstown in a shock result in the uh, quarterfinal. And then we beat Maynooth, luckily, in the semifinal. And then we beat UCG, who had Pat Bond um, and um, one of the twins from Kilfenora on the team, Aidan, uh, in, in, in the final. And we were fortunate to beat them. But we had, we had the X-Factor. We had Morris Fitzgerald. In three games, Michael, he scored one goal and 17 points in three days. Yeah. He did not miss a free, any free from the 45 or inside. He did not miss it in three days. And people don't appreciate how difficult Sigerson is. It's not the beautiful stuff of summertime, but it, it does, it, like for the likes of Morris to get that tally and, and probably the hits he was taking in, he wouldn't, you wouldn't be protected like you would be into county level. So for, to, for him to tally that, and for Lads to play three games and, as you say, there wasn't a medical scientific backup. It was real old, old school. It, it, you found your character. Yeah, you did. And look, I, I'm not. I, I'm not. The, I'm a very. For, I am incredibly fortunate to have been on that team and won that. In fact, there's only this. I know some my father cry two days ever, and that was a John uh, <clears throat> Marin's funeral and the day we won the Sigerson, John Marin from Milton, and uh, who who lived in the flag road as we did. And Marty Marlin's son. Marty was a, was a legend of the club, as as was John. And um, anyway, uh, I, I'll never forget that day. And a lot of Clare fellas, a number of Clare fellas, like Liam Neely and Dara Blake and, and some others have gone on to win Sigerson. But you're you're right, that format was really tough. And uh, Morris was uh, was exceptional. But you know, the thing that I remember from that as well, Michael, is you talk about the lead up. Morris was sure would go down to the Mardike five days a week with a bag of balls with myself. And I would kick him out to practice the kickouts, and then he would kick the freeze. Five days every single week for weeks on end before the Sigerson. So it wasn't an accident he was doing it. Well, whose yeah. idea was that? Was it was it Mick Dwyer that took? Was it Mick? Was Mick over the team? Was he suggested? Or did he take it on yourselves? No, I no. Well, well, we took it on our, Well, he took it on. I mean, I don't deserve the credit for that. He would say to me, "You," because you know he was a cute carry man. He needs someone to kick the ball out to him, so <laughs> he might as well get the goalkeeper. So you know, um, but no, but uh, Morris was. A, we we were great friends, even though he was he was a bit younger than me. But through the football, we were wonderful friends. And it was his idea to go down because that was the way. But no, Mick O'Dwyer was our manager in first year, and then Mick went on to do other things. Then we'd Billy Morgan the second year. And then with Bob Honan, Bob Honan from Cork, who's passed away, uh, God rest his soul, he was the coach when we won the Sigerson. Very smart, canny guy who, you know, with limited resources at the time, he actually used thumb to go to the other matches to see the opposition that weekend. So when we were finished, he'd go and watch the other match. He'd thumb to whatever neighbouring town they were on in, in, uh, in around uh, Kildare and come back with the intel and share that with us. And um, now he was a very good, ma- a very good coach. What's brought you to Australia, and when did you tra- when did you go out? Yeah, well, Brenda, Brenda, my wife, who is who is from Limerick, but has a very strong, by the way, clear connection. Um, uh, she her her father's family are from McGonagall, and in fact, sadly, her father passed away 
right. on Christmas Eve. Yeah, which is very sad. And they played, they played hurling, um, and he played hurling, and in fact he played hurling in London, and and uh, he helped out uh, one of the clubs in London there for, for quite a while when and he was there. His, what, what's his name? What, what was his? Her, Michael her? Michael O'Farrell was his name. Michael O'Farrell, and he's married to Patricia O'Farrell, who's from Leitrim, who's who's still alive and resides in in Limerick, okay. and and the rest of the family are in and around Limerick. So um, anyway, where was I? I got lost. Australia. Yeah, so we got married in 01. Brendan and I knew each other quite a while. We were in university together and we, you know, we knew each other from being around the traps. And she had come back from America and I'd come back from Russia and I was in Dublin and we met and we got married. And long story shortish. And then we said, listen, why don't we travel while we can? So we said, okay, I was working for General Electric and we said, let's let's go to Australia. And I transferred with the company thinking we'd go for two years in 2001. So we got married in April and we went out in August via South Africa. A big adventure, thinking we'd be back, you know, two years yes. later. Well, 20 years later, Michael, we are still here and with a 15 year old. <laughs> that's right. So that's, yeah. So look, it's been a, to be honest with you, it's, I can still remember the day we left. I can still remember the day we arrived. Uh, time flies, you know. And you mentioned um, Darren Blake. Is there, and is it, are Darren Dermot outside with you at the moment? Yeah, Dara and Dermot are out here. Um, Dara is is playing and coaching St. Kevin's and Dermot is coaching and s- selecting. He's, he has an injury, so he can't play. And my club is Padraig Pierce. So we're sort of competing with them on the club front here. But of course, because because I know them and we know each other, we, we get on famously. And I, I was speaking recently, and I interviewed uh, Garo Considine, a friend of yours, yes. we, we all know him from Craplow, and he gave a brilliant interview. Yes. I recorded him last week. He was a man, he's explained too about how important the, the whole social aspect is to the GA in Australia's part. I know why you're competitive and you want to win. It's more about keeping in contact with your, with your brethren as much as anything else. Yeah, look, like everything else in life, there are exceptions to these things, but, uh, you know, and, and there's... But but overall, I would totally agree with Gerard. The, the, like the vast majority of us out here, see it as we're we're far away from home. You know, we're we're playing and getting and being involved in GA, which means so much to us and which is so important to us. And Gerard, of course, fantastic guy. Of course, he was amazingly talented hurler. He play he actually plays with Gary Owen down here, so he comes down from Sydney and plays hurling with them. And quite and I'll always meet him when he comes down because he's almost like family to me because my mother taught him in Cardavan. And oh, of course, yeah. his father did a lot of work in our house, and and he's you know he's read to the Murphys as well, the, the famous Murphys from Kilmel, Martin Murphy, of course, who was a, an amazing footballer. But no, Garrod is right. It, it is it is part of the social tapestry here. It's really important because, for example, like during COVID one, I call it Wave one. Uh, I run a manufacturing business, and we gave a lot of work to Irish boys and girls, or young men and women who you know were kind of trapped. They couldn't get home and they couldn't get proper work here. When I say proper work, like the, in their in their chosen profession. So, we, you know, a lot of us helped out, gave them work in factories or, you know, maybe on farms or whatever. And um, it sort of got them through. And that's part of that's part of what's important here is looking after our own and making sure they're OK and and yeah. um, giving them a leg up. And do you find um, many clear people over there now. I don't I don't really need to know names because you can often leave out people. But is is this is yeah. clear is the clear connection still as strong as ever there or do you find that maybe there's not as many as you, as there was 10 or 15 years ago? Uh, it's an interesting question. You know, so, so I, I think there's more in some ways more younger uh, like Martin Murf, Martin Murphy's and I, I know you you're right you might forget somebody but Martin Murphy's daughter's out here Russian she's a nurse I met her the other day but I do have to mention one man an amazing man who came out here in 1959, Paddy Fitzgerald from Badike. And you no, know, he's you know, he, he's been he's a great musician, plays the box, I think. Yeah, he does. And I met him at the football. In fact, that night I was a referee and he was on the sideline watching the football. And you know, he's a great character, part of the older Claire Guard that are here. And we we're having a bit of a chat about things and Claire and how things were going and why he came out here and all of that. But there's quite a lot of younger, you know, like like the, you know, like Dara and Dermot. Quite a lot of younger, clear people here and having a good time here and doing well here. Um, and then there's some who come and go. Like uh, Joe Joro Winslad came and worked for me for a while. Joey and he's gone back. I I think he's back in Ireland now. So 
you have that transient workforce as well, but you do have a lot of younger Clare people who are making a life for themselves here and doing very well in, in, in Australia. Do you, do, you, do you think the fact that, pe that Irish people and people, in, we say people who come to Australia in general, that were trapped last year couldn't end up staying now because they might get a, an affinity for the place? Yeah, well, it's look the thing about the thing about us, the, the thing about Australia. It's very easy to get an affinity because you know, particularly out of COVID. I mean, the weather is generally very good here. The economy is very strong, bolstered by it's got a very strong resource sector. There's a lot of stuff in the ground, and it's mm -hmm. going to be in the ground for quite a while yet. And China wants it. I'm I'm simplifying it, but it's got a very strong financial services sector because of government policy. There's there's fundamental and plus it only has 25 million. We only have 25 million people, so you know there's a lot of reasons why it's attractive from the state. The big reason not to stay and why it's not attractive, of course, is so far from home. And right now that's not attractive because you can't bloody well get home. And I mean, Brenda and I, of course, experienced the worst side of that when somebody passed away. We couldn't go back. Yeah. But uh, you know, mo mo most of the younger people that are here, you know, they're getting lots of opportunity. No, I'm not having a go at Ireland at all on the country. I. I have actually a policy of not doing that at all because I think uh, one should never knock your country at all, but uh, I, especially if you're at a distance. But I think that there is no doubt the evidence is here that the, the young Irish who are here who want to work and do well, uh, you know, they get lots of opportunity and they enjoy that um, and, yes. and, and, and they want to pursue that, you know. Yeah. I, I suppose I, if you want to chat about it for a second, I suppose your dad passed away last year, you know, unfortunately. He did. <clears throat> In the middle of COVID, I suppose, if, how brief, briefly, how did you, how, how was that for you as a family? I suppose, as you say, your 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 wife had the same issue. Like it's, a, it's I suppose it's a, it's a difficult, it's a difficult thing to see a, uh, to see the funeral on, on a camera. Oh yeah, I mean, you know, it's and it's not, it's no, it's no problem talking about it, Michael. And it's important to talk about it because it's all part of life, you know. I mean. There's only two things certain in life: that's death and taxes. And <laughs> and you know, and I think I think also on reflect, you know, when you're out here, and I'll speak openly about this because I think it's important, you know, more important than talking about football in some ways. But my father never wanted me to be here. You know, he hated the fact I was here. He never got used to the fact I was here, even up to you know, say before his passing. My mother was much more understanding of it. Uh, I don't think she liked it either or likes it either. My mother's still alive and very healthy and she's she's an, an amazing woman in so many ways. But dad never liked, he wanted me to be at home, be involved in the GA and, and, and be around. You know, he wanted that. And that's the truth. And mm. So he really struggled with me being here. Um, but when he passed, you know, it's funny. I always wondered when the phone call would come, being here for 20 years. My wife's the same. When would the call come when somebody, you know, would have passed? But of course, when the call came, you thought, well, I'll get on a plane and I'll go back and I'll be there for the funeral, at least, yeah. you know, yeah. uh, or, or, or in my wife's case, if, if, you know, there was a time when her father was well, she went back and she was able to be with her father uh, when he wasn't so well and he recovered, which is great. She, she just went back at the drop of a hat and that was great. But in this was this was terrible. This was surreal because in, bo in both instances, we couldn't go back. In Brenda's case, she saw, we watched from Tasmania, actually, her father's funeral at the Holy Rosary Church, uh, just 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 there off the Ennis Road. Uh, but in Dad's case, he didn't have a funeral. You know, there was no funeral. Oh, uh, I think it was P I think it was PJ McGuan, you know, who was a great GM and um, and I think narrowly missed out on being county chairman. Um, who was a great court chairman and a great GM. Yeah. And you know, I think he in one of his comments he said, you know, and he he articulated very well how sad and disappointing it was that people didn't get a chance to give my father a send off not because you know my father was a great was you know i think he's a great man i'm biased and all that of course yeah. but people want to do that they want that's an irish thing as well they want to give people a send off now having said that and i won't name any names but probably a few people broke the law when when they did uh, you know they lined the route and the guards yes. were very accommodating that time and that and my friend david hillary commissioned that video to be made mm. uh, of dad's hearse going through the town and that was pretty special. And yeah. also the, you know, the fact that they were able to have people at the grave. And I'll tell you, not only did the Milltown Club do very well that day, the Kilmoria Bricken Club were also very good that day. So we're very appreciative of, of all yeah. those people's efforts. I suppose your, your father was a very colourful character at 
county board meetings, he, if I may say, he'd, he'd come in with the, the military strut and the hash and everything, and uh, everyone said, here comes the colonel again. But he, he was a very, um, how would I call it, he the way when he stood up, maybe a certain percentage one might say, oh God, no one is at it again, but he, he, he really fought for the little men. And he, he thought very differently to most people. He had a broader mind for an Ireland that was maybe not as broad at the time. Yeah, look, my, my, my father, you know, like all of us, uh, wasn't perfect. Uh, you know, we're all infallible in the, mm. in the eyes of whatever we believe in, our creator. And, um, you know, he had, like we all do, he had faults and, you know, um, and, and people were happy to point those out. And I think he was reasonably, well, at times he was reasonably self-aware. But he did have a, when it came to the GA, he did have a lot of confidence in himself and what he had to say and what he believed in. Yes. But I, I, I do believe, and I think you're alluding to this, it did come from within, you know, like he passionately believed in things, not for the sake of the agenda or, or, or the particular moment. If he believed in something, he really truly believed in and, and thought it through. Now, my father thought about the GA 24-7. Now, I know a lot of people are passionate about the GA, but he never stopped thinking about it. Mm. He never stopped talking about it. He never stopped believing it. I mean, it was just, he was a zealot, yeah. you know? And, um, you know, I think most people at the end of the day, and even through, even though he was annoying at times, and you know, maybe he was putting stuff forward that people didn't agree with, or they, or maybe sometimes he was blocking stuff they didn't agree with. Although he generally didn't block, he was generally putting stuff forward. I think he had a lot of respect across the county. I think both so, yeah. on the football side and the hurling side. I, yeah. think, I think a lot of his ideas were ahead of their time. And maybe yeah. in 1990s mm. Ireland, they weren't as accepted as much as they might be now. And there might be people now putting forward suggestions that won't be seen as practical for another 20 years. So, why, and he, as I said, he, 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 fought for, he, he fought for his cause, but it was, it was in a democratic way. He'd always accept another point of view. Well, no, he, he, this is interesting you say that, because, I mean, I would see the aftermath when he would come home. And, you know, not, not that we, you know, when I was younger, we wouldn't do a major debrief on the meetings. But, you know, I would talk, to, I spoke, talk, and I think I mentioned this when he passed. I wrote a little piece of the champion. And we spent a lot of time together. I was very fortunate from you know from from a young age to when i was 30 i spent a lot of time with my father not everyone can say that i was yeah. blessed you know yeah, yeah. but of course the fact that we had a common interest we were, i was very lucky you know not every and and you know kids are different my my lad is not as passionate about the ga as i am so he's passionate about other things right skateboarding and rap music and so you got to go with the flow right although he does like sport but not as he's not as obsessed as as i am but the the thing is that um he and it's interesting what you said about the small person you know, Dad was quite critical as well. He could be very critical of players and critical of what things would happen. And, that, you know, even I, well, I would get that as well. But but, but it was always coming from a position of we could do better, we can improve, you know, yeah. we, could, we can advance, whether it was the club or whether it was the junior team or whether it was, whether it was the senior team. So it was coming, always felt coming from, from the right place. Um, but, you know, the one thing also he, he truly believed in was he was all about the players. You know, some administrators think about the administration his view was that he's all about the players and whatever we do must be for the players and about the players. And he truly and passionately believed that. Yeah, I suppose just to maybe to wrap up a bit, um, where would you see yourself in 10 years time? I suppose is, is Australia now your, your base for good and glory or would you, I, I presume, when was that actually, I meant to say, when was the last time you were back in Ireland? I was back oh, in man. Ireland, uh, she was just talking about this today, September, Last September, twelve months ago, I was back, uh, and obviously I, I was I met everybody and I was with everybody, and, and it was wonderful. Um, we, in the twenty years we've been here, we've gone back on average one if, once a year, so we've been back a lot. So you're keeping uh, connections. Yeah, well, that was a commitment I made to myself. I said, I said, I've come a long way. You know, it was hard for Dad in particular and Mom, mm. and uh, I my commitment to them, and it's you know it was a big commitment because financially it's a lot and whatever, but it was to get back every year. And on average, that's what we did. Now, the fact that Brenda's from Ireland made it easier as well because we were heading in the right direction for the right yes. for the same purpose. But the interesting thing about that, Michael, is that is that when you know a bit more deeply, is that Matthew, our son, who is an Australian, has a massive connection to Ireland, massive connection to both sides of the family and his cousins. And you know, he's been to Munster finals, he's been to lots of hurling matches as well. He's played a bit of hurling here as well, by the way. He played up in Sydney. 
uh, in, in an invitational hurling tournament, and it was a great experience for him. And so his connection to Ireland and its culture and, and its people is, you know, was a byproduct of going back so often, which I didn't know at the time would be the, key, the case, but is a fantastic yeah. thing. And he wants to even go back and study in Ireland, maybe in third level, go back and study there if he can. UCC, probably. Well, preferably, but, you know, uh, you know, and you, you asked me where it would be in 10 years. Well, I don't know about you. Are you, you know, I don't know if you're married, Michael. Are yeah. you married? No, I'm not. Okay, not. well, all right. Okay, well, I'm married. And, and you know, generally speaking, um, she must be obeyed. So if I go by that principle, we, we won't be going anywhere. She, my wife, Brenda, loves it here. She's got, she's a, she's got a great job here. She's a social worker. She loves her job. She loves her friends. Uh, she loves the place. You know, Matthew grew up here. He's going to school here. So, you know, I wouldn't do anything to to disrupt that. Um, and you know, I'm 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 happy here too. I mean, I miss Ireland a lot. Uh, yeah. You know, I miss I miss my mother in particular a lot. But you know, the fact is, my 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 family, my base is here, and and uh, they're very happy here. So the, the likelihood is we'll be here in ten years. I suppose we finish in a couple of uh, one one word answers. The questions. Okay. Have I been saying too much, Mikey? No, no. Yeah. Oh God, no, no. This is this, this will make sure that you're remembered back in West Ter. Your most difficult right. opponent. I know you couldn't go it. Who was your most difficult opponent in a Ter football field? Fellow, you didn't a want to think about team, it. Team, team or individual? We we go by individual first. Was there anyone that you did not want to kick the ball out to because he used to embarrass you by kicking it back over your head? There was, oh, I'm trying to remember his surname. Uh, there was a marvellous club forward for Kiki, Terence. I can't remember his surname. Um, he was a very talented player. Didn't, might have made the county team, played in the full forward line. He was incredible. I forget his surname now. Jer- Jerry Kelly will kill me and Noel Roach will kill me. But I, he I, I was... Was O'Neill? No, I don't think it was O'Neill. He, and I would say... I would say from Dunbeg, because uh, Dunbeg, you you know, were were the team that we most respected back in the nineties. They were very dominant, and they were the backbone of the county team. Parry Conway was an incredibly dangerous. In the end, got all the credit he deserved. In the beginning, was a bit un, was underrated. He was something else at club level. He was incredibly dangerous. And who was your Milltown's most difficult opponent as, as a team? In your time, oh, Dunbeg. Okay. Dun, Dunbeg, by a mile. Why was I that? Mean, Dunbeg, would, Dunbeg had, ta- they, well, they had, first of all, very strong culture, you know, down there, not only in the team, but across in the town and the village and the, its hinterland. Yes. Uh, everybody believed in, in, in it. They were, they were like, they were zealots. In, I mean, in a good way, like my father, from, from, from the youngest to the oldest. Um, they had, inc- and at that time, they had incredible talent. I mean, Porrick Conway, you know, um, they had Francis McInerney. The Killeens. Um, the, the Jerry Killeen. Kieran Mahoney, you know, incredible cornerback. One of the best defenders I've ever yeah. seen. I played behind him, you know. Yeah. Um, very effective. They had, they had great talent. Uh, they had great people on the line. And, and I'll tell you what, the, the village, the whole village and, the, and its hinterland was behind them. Yeah. Who was your favourite footballer to watch? In the club, and who was your favorite footballer to watch? In Clare, yeah. Who was your favorite club footballer in Milltown, and who was your favorite club footballer in County Clare? Is that a two I'm different? Gonna get, two, I, I'm going to get killed like answering from Milltown because if I if I miss <laughs> someone out, but I think the player that excited me the most uh, watching him when he was fit was Sean Burke. Okay. No, the people say I'm biased because he lived across the road, but I think he was the most like 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 what's his name? Owen Cleary is now, but I only mm. watch him on streaming. Sean Burke was 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 the most exciting footballer that, that I saw in my lifetime playing for Milton. So you you've yeah. now lost a hundred friends in Milton. But who's your who's who's your most fit? Who was your who was the in the clear intercounty footballer? We're just saying in your time that you that you said this is the go-to man. He's he was brilliant to watch. Intercounty player. Oh well, um, you know, the most the most exciting. I, I know I know, <laughs> I'm gonna have to mention two here. Okay. I mean I mean Martin Daly was electrifying yes. in action. 
It's the only word to describe him. I mean, Martin Daly was class, electrifying. He had all the skills. But of course, in terms of entertainment, I have to mention my great friend, Tom Morrissey, who yes. may not have shone for many years, but when he shone, he shone so brightly. Yes. So brightly. Allied to the fact that we were going out with two nurses in Dublin for a while, and we must have had the best time ever together for a few years there. But the nurses were giving you ter- therapy after medical injuries you might have. And things of, like course, that. of course, yes, of it course. It's all, yes. all above board. Yes, so obviously, so we, 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 may not, we may not go into those stories. I don't think we can afford the no, legal fees. No, no, anyway, no, listen, no, it's too early. It's too early in the morning or too late at night for that. <laughs> listen, again, thanks very much, Carl. It was an illuminating chat. You gave us a lot of information about your own time and about your family's time in the GA and also... And yeah, you're, you're, by the sound of it, you're going to probably be running for president in twenty years' time. You're, you're coming up. You're coming up the inside track in the Euro in the Asian board. So we we we, we probably see you strutting into con- Congress in maybe ten years' time, and they'll be wondering, is it Noel all over again? Michael, so. I'm fifty-three. In twenty years' time, I'll be seventy-three. You hardly, although although Biden, that, 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 Biden that, that, is. Biden is around America and he's well into his 70s. Now no, you're even thinking like an American. Listen, thanks very much for the chat. It was brilliant. And we t- hopefully we meet in Cusick Park sometime. Okay. God bless you, Michael. And God bless everybody back in Clare. Take care. That's good.